السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. In the last lecture we started overviewing the diversity of chemical applications and also we started paying attention to the expression. Of any measurements, we discussed the uh, different types of units, uh, particularly the SI system of units, uh, and also we gave uh, some definitions, basic definitions for uh, pressures, temperature scales, and today, inshallah, we will continue uh, talking about the accuracy and the precision of measurements and how can you uh, calculate the uh, this uh, accuracy or uh, we will uh, show how we can identify our measurement as a precise or not precise accurate or not accurate all this we will uh, discuss in, in today's lecture, inshallah. Uh, it remained from the last lecture, this exercise, about the pressure and the, the, the units convergence of pressures. Uh, it says the pressure of a gas is measured as 49 torr represents this pressure in both atmospheres and, and the basket, okay? Uh, you remember in the last lectures we uh, we gave some uh, uh, information about the convergence of pressure units. One atmosphere equal to 760 uh, torr, 760 uh, uh, millimeter mercury. Uh, so uh, and and also one atmosphere equal to uh, around 10 to the power 5 pascal, 10 to the power 5 pascal. So to calculate this, very simply, you can convert 49 torr with this uh, conversion factor to uh, get the results in the atmosphere. Very simple. And once you, you know the, the unit in the uh, in atmosphere, you can calculate it back to the pascal with this formula. The pressure in Pascal equal to the pressure atmosphere times this conversion factor, which is around 10, 10 to the power 5 Pascal per 1 atmosphere. So the results will end to, with this value in Pascal. Okay? So, uh, principally in the uh, uh, midterm exam, the final exam, we sometimes ask about the unit conversions in, uh, for temperature for pressure so you need to uh, memorize the uh, equivalent values for atmosphere for pascal for uh, torr for millimeter mercury centimeter mercury for fahrenheit and temperature for uh, celsius kelvin how can you convert from this to that okay so all this should be familiar you, you should be familiar with all these conversions today in today's lecture, we'll start talking about the different types of errors in measurements. Different types of error in measurements. And then we'll move to the significance figures and how can you identify the number of significance figures in a given value you measured. And after that, we will uh, discuss very interesting topic in chemistry, which is called the limiting reactant. Limiting React the concept of limiting react. So initially, we will talk about errors. Okay, if I give you a ruler and I ask you to measure the length of something, and I move this request to several persons, okay, do you think they will all agree in the measurement, or possibly they? may disagree together. They can disagree definitely with each other. They can disagree uh, based on the sensitivity of their eyes. Maybe 
based on the sensitivity of the tool itself and how it's divided uh, and if it can detect the, the, the very fine uh, details of the length or not, right? So uh, this is the origin of the different errors. Maybe it comes from the personal identification or it may originate from the, the tool itself or maybe the conditions. Someone may be detecting the solar radiation it depends on the weather or the trees existing in the way of measurement. Many, many, many things may influence the reading that you can measure. Okay? And this is the origin of error. And this error can be classified to the two different types. The first one is called the systematic or determinate error. Systematic. And from the, 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 the word itself, systematic, it means that it is repeating every time with the same magnitude in the same direction. Systematic. Systematic means that if I ask you to weigh this uh, mobile phone, okay, and I ask another one to weigh, the value may be repeated even if error exists, both of them will go to the balance and they will weigh the, the mobile, but the error may originate from some dust on the band of the balance. So both of them will measure differently, but they will agree to some extent in the value of the error. Okay, so the systematic error is repeating in the same direction. I mean by the same direction, if the value is high or the value is low. Every time will be high or every time will be low. Every time will be to the negative direction or every time will be to the positive direction. Maybe less or more, less or more. But every time will be in the same direction. Every time will be in the same value. This is called the systematic or determinate error. So this type of error exists in every reading of a series of repeating measurements, like a speck of dust on a pen. Okay? It also occurs always in the same direction, with the same magnitude, as I said, either high or, or low. In experimental observations, if you are uh, doing uh, an experiment in the lab, this type of error usually comes from the measuring instruments. If you are measuring with a pipette, with a purette, okay? Using this type of tools may be the reason for this, for this, for this error. Uh, and uh, for, for, for that reason, uh, if you remember in the, the first semester in the lab, uh, if you want to get accurately uh, a certain volume uh, to transfer a certain volume, uh, we asked you in the lab to use a pipette, not a cylinder, because the cylinder is big. So the error will likely be higher. So if you go to something very narrow, the error will be minor. The error will be minor. So the tool itself will assign the, uh, the, the this type of error or the, the systematic uh, error. This type actually is very difficult to be detect even if you are uh, uh, experts in the field. Okay. So usually because uh, this type of error is related to the true value of the measurement. It's related how far your measurement is, uh, is from the true value. And getting the true value is something very difficult. It's something very, even in, in the scales when, when you go to buy some uh, tomatoes or uh, any vegetables, uh, the, 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 Ma the balancing the, the amount is something of, 
is 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 uh, calibrated some way uh, to get uh, approximate mass of the material is not is not exactly the same is not true 100% but something is approximated approximated okay so uh, knowing a true value for anything is something very difficult and this type of error is related to the true value so that's why they saying that the, the systematic error are difficult to detect even for for experts uh, examples for this is uh, there's something wrong with if, if something is wrong with the instrument or uh, uh, its data handling system this will uh, uh, give some systematic systematic error uh, if the instrument also is wrongly used by the experimenter if you are using the machine uh, in a wrong way this will result in a systematic error i encourage you to go to these two websites and i will uh, upload the lecture for you uh, to get more details and more examples about uh, the different types of uh, of errors uh, this systematic errors uh, in uh, uh, chemistry is also uh, appear uh, uh, it appears also in uh, two different uh, types one of them is called the offset or zero setting uh, and this ha happens actually uh, if uh, the the zero value which is supposed to appear without uh, any measurement uh, is not adjusted uh, properly when you go to uh, use the balance for example uh, you have to uh, to uh, to set the balance to the zero value at the beginning if you forgot to do that all the measurements after that will have this offset offset error okay so the offset error uh, if the instrument does not read zero when the quantity to be measured is zero this is one class from the systematic systematic error. the other type is the multiplier or scale factor and this if the instrument consistently read change in the quantity to be measured greater or less than the actual value this is something defect in the balance itself okay is reading uh, higher uh, values than the, the material that you are measuring or less uh, than the actual the actual change and uh, more exercise uh, this is the error in measurements of temperature due to poor thermal contact between thermometer and the substance whose temperature is to be found you want to get the temperature of something but there is a leak between the thermometer and the material to be measured this leak can uh, leak this leak can uh, make a systematic a systematic error another example the errors in measurements of the solar radiation because trees or buildings shade the radiometer as i mentioned for you uh, previously accuracy of measurement is often reduced by systematic error okay uh, the existence of systematic error make problems in the accuracy of measurement in the accuracy of measure and uh, next i will uh, differentiate between accuracy and the precision but i want you to pay attention that accuracy is connected to the systematic error to the systematic error the other type of errors is called random non-systematic indeterminate errors uh, and from the name of this type of error that this error is not systematic not every time you you may not observe it every time of measurement and if you ask it several persons to measure something everyone may uh, may give uh, different readings one is uh, more than the true value and one is less than the true value in all directions in all magnitudes okay so this is the opposite to the systematic error okay uh, and this type of error caused by unknown unpredictable changes in the measurement 
uh, or in the env environmental conditions. It varies randomly in a series of repeated measures, uh, measurements, and uh, we will start talking here about the average. The average. Always in the lab or in the measurements, we ask people to uh, increase the number of measurements and to, to take the average of the measurements. This will reduce the random the random error. So the random error is connected to the accuracy, connected to the uh, connected to the precision, connected to the uh, uh, the the standard deviations. We will talk about this right now. So it have an equal probability of being high or being low. It occurs in estimating the value of the last digit of a measurement. The last digit of a measurement. Okay? Example for, uh, for the uh, random error is the electronic noise in the circuit of an electrical instrument. Uh, sometimes when you measure with some instruments, something happens, you, you cannot even understand what happened. Something that the machine is not reading. Uh, as expected, okay? So maybe something like this, some noise in the circuit, some uh, heat dissipation, huh? all of this can uh, result in uh, a random error. A regular change in the heat uh, loss uh, rate from a solar collector due to changes in the wind, okay? So this also is uh, a reason for the random, for the random error. Handling random error, as I said, random error often have a Gaussian normal distribution, like this plot. Uh, this is very similar to the results even of any course. If you, uh, if, 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 if normally the grades are, uh, uh, the, 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 the exam are uh, graded perfectly, uh, you should have some distribution like this, Gaussian, normal Gaussian distribution. Uh, some people may uh, get the highest degree, some people may fail, and the rest is in between. The rest is in between like this, okay? So uh, the random error is, is the same. Some results may go to the negative direction, some results may go to the positive direction. Direction is not, is not uh, fixed to one, uh, one uh, direction. But both directions are okay. The value, the magnitude itself is not, is not fixed. But it varies like this, like this figure. Okay? Uh, and hence, statistical methods may be used to analyze the data. So, uh, statistical methods, uh, are assigned to handle this type of error, which is a random error, random, Error. So the mean value of a number of n measurements of the same quantity is the best estimate of that quantity, quantity and the standard deviation S of the measurement shows the accuracy of the estimate. And then you can also calculate the standard error which is given by S over square root of n. So the uh, statistical methods can calculate the deviation of any measurements from the mean value, from the mean. Here, in this plot, M here is the mean value, and uh, the, 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 the extreme of the, of the x-axis here uh, represent how far the measurements are from, from the mean value. And the M here is the mean value, and the S is the standard deviation. So the values almost more than 99.9 percent .9 of the results of the results lies between m minus 3s and m plus 3s. Okay, so this is the significance of of this figure. Okay, uh, the connection between the random error and the precision. You remember in the uh, in the systematic error, I said. Uh, is, is connected directly with the accuracy. And the accuracy actually measures how far the measured value from the true value. 
and knowing the true value is a bit difficult. Okay, but here in the random error is connected directly to the precision of the measure, and the precision means that how a set of results agrees together, not with the true value, not with the true value. You measure something uh, in the lab, uh, and the first time you read, uh, for example, 3.1, the next one, uh, 3.2, the, the third one, uh, 2.9, all of them are related to each other. Maybe the true value will be 1.5. So it's very far from them. So these results will not be accurate, but they are precise because they are repeated in the same way. They are repeated in the same way. So precision has nothing to deal with the accuracy, but it deals with repeating the results and uh, getting them in the same in the same direction with the approximate values okay so the random error is related to the precision precision of a measure is how close a number of measurements of the same quantity agree with each other nothing to uh, relate here to the accuracy nothing is related to the true value the exact value but the, it depends on the level of agreement between the results themselves. Okay? Not, nothing is related to the, to the true value. The precision is limited to the random error. Uh, by the random error, it may usually be determined by repeating the measurements. Okay? So, uh, to summarize, accuracy refers to the agreement of a particular value with the true value with the true value. But precision refers to the degree of agreement among results, um, among several measurements of the same quantity. Uh, the precision also reflects the reproducibility of a given type of measurement. If I ask you in the lab, uh, are your results reproducible or not reproducible? Reproducibility means that if you repeat the measurements every time you get very similar value or not? This is a reproducibility. Okay, so reproducibility is connected directly or reflecting actually the precision of the measurement, the precision of the measurement. Okay, uh, this is uh, this is an interesting example reflecting the difference between accuracy and the precision. You remember this uh, throwing darts, this uh, uh, game, okay, uh, which appear here. If uh, all this uh, uh, darts is trying to the uh, to reach the uh, the target inside here. So if they are all agreeing together to get the the center of this uh, chart, uh, we we say that that they are agree together in in uh, in the results here. So they are uh, precise. And also, as they are targeting the uh, the correct uh, position, they are also accurate. So this is both precise and accurate. Okay, look at, at the second one here. They agree together, but they disagree with the correct value, right? So we will say that they are precise but not accurate. They are precise but not. Accurate. Look at the third one here. They disagree in everything. Okay? So we'll say they are neither accurate nor precise. Okay? So I think now you could get uh, information about the difference between accuracy and, and precision and the different types of, of error in the measurements. Okay? Uncertainty in the measurements. This is a period that you may uh, use in the laboratory. And this is the scale is going from 20 uh, milliliter, 21. So if you magnify this part here to get this here, this is 20. The first small line here is uh, uh, 0.1 and the second one 0.2. Okay, so 20, this is 20.1, 20.2. 
if I asked you to read the volume here, what do you expect? Is 20.15. Okay. Uh, another reading. Some other one may say uh, 20 point uh, zero one zero two zero three zero four zero five anything between one and nine right is uh, plausible is possible right right so we all agree that the number two is Correct, right? Has no doubt. It's not doubtful. Two and zero also in this number. We said 20. 20. 20.16. 20.14. 20.16. 17.15. All these readings agree that number two here and zero. And the one, they are fixed in all measurements. They are fixed. Has no any doubt. Okay? But the, 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 the last number here is doubtful. So the, the, the three letters here, the three digits don't are, uh, exact number. Exact number. Or, uh, certain number, certain numbers, but the, the last one, the last one here is uncertain, is doubtful, is doubtful. Okay. Uh, can you add any other number here after the, 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 uh, in the, in the third decimal positions, in the third decimal, can, can we add anything? We cannot, actually, because the machine here cannot read more than one undoubtful or one doubtful digit. One doubtful digit, okay? So usually the buret uh, cannot read more than the 100th position, okay? So the the two zero dot one are certain digits, but the last digit is estimated or said uncertain, doubtful digit. Okay. So significance figures when uh, I ask, uh, I asked you to assign the number of significance figure in a certain number like this, according to the measuring tool here, the significance figures are basically the number of certain digits plus the first uncertain digit plus the first uncertain digit so in these numbers how many significance figures we have four four i said the significance figures are basically the number of certain digits plus the first undigit uh, the, the first uh, uncertain number Okay, so here we have four significance figures. You may not express the second, you cannot express the second uncertain digit because you, you already have uh, estimated one. You have estimated one. You cannot add if in the measurements more than one estimated, more than one estimate. Only one is estimated and you should be familiar that the last one here is estimated, is not certain, is not certain, but the preceding digits here are certain, all of them, okay? So significance figure, any measurements is re reported by the recording, only significance figure, all certain digits plus the first uncertain Uncertainty. For a pure rate, it would not make any sense to record the volume of thousands of a milliliter like this. Because uh, th th this is insignificant. If you roll this in the lab, I I incorrect. Okay? Uh, because the value of the hundreds, which is the second uh, decimal place here, 
okay of a milliliter must be estimated okay so it has no meaning to add more estimated digits to this to this read in analyzing a sample of polluted water if i give you two different tools to measure a volume of 25 milliliters and one of them was a, a fine pipette like this one which is uh, 25 milliliter but is 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 capable to estimate the uh, the decimal places uh, two decimal places like this okay uh, and i gave you uh, another time what uh, a measuring cylinder like this and i asked you to to measure the same volume what is the difference between uh, this value and this value okay this value 25 milliliter means that the, the, this value lies between 2 24 and 26 but measuring with this tool with this tool okay uh, with the pipette here means that the volume is located between 24.99 and 25.01 which is more precise which is more precise the pipette of, it's uh, the pipette of course right so uh, if you want to be precise in the measurements you need to i uh, select the proper tool to measure with okay so a bit measures the volume with much greater precision. Counting significance figure. We have uh, some rules. Yes. Yes. No, not the exact. I said uh, precise means that uh, uh, it gives a reproducible measurement. Every time you measure, you will get the same the same volume or almost uh, very close uh, results, okay? So, uh, for any measurements that, that you can take from a tool, uh, and you have uh, some uh, numbers, if I asked you to, to assign the different, uh, how many significance figures are there in this number, you have to follow the, the rules that I will describe uh, right now. Rule number one, uh, that all non-zero digits are always significant. All, all non-zero digits are always significant. Uh, the problem in the zeros, if they are significant or not. We have three different types of zeros. Number one is the uh, leading zeros which are zeros preceding non-zero digits, like this. Zeros preceding non-zero digits. All leading zeros are not significant. Actually, we can write this uh, number, which is 0 0.0025. We can write it 2.5 times 10 to the uh, minus uh, 3, right? So uh, all preceding zeros ha has, uh, have nothing to do with the significance figure. So the leading zeros are not significant, okay? You should memorize this rule. Number two is the captive zero, which are zeros between non-zero digits, between non-zero digits. These captive zeros are always significant, are always significant. <coughs> and this is example. How many significance figures we have in this number? Four. Okay. Why? Because all non-zero digits are significant and capital zeros are always significant. Okay. The third type is the trailing zero, which are zeros at the right end of the number. At the right end of the number. Okay. This trailing zeros are a bit tricky. Okay, we have two different cases for this trailing zero. Depending on the existence of a decimal point. If a decimal point exists, this trailing zeros will be significant. If is absent, this zeros will be insignificant. Okay, so we have examples here for the hundred like this. How many significance figures we have? Only one because this 
training zeros are not significant here because we do not have a decimal point. But if we have a decimal point, like in this example here, then we have three significant figures. Okay? So this is the rules for non-zero. All non-zeros are significant. And then we have leading zeros are not significant. Capitative zeros are significant. Leading zero, if decimal point exists, then they will be significant. If the decimal point is absent, they are not significant. So these, these are the rules. And we have another number. It's called exact number. Exact number. Exact number. Uh, these are the numbers that can be obtained by counting, not measurements, not measurements, okay, by counting or by definition. Counting, like I say, uh, we have 10 apples. Uh, did you measure these 10 apples or you count them? You count them, okay? So all numbers that are obtained by counting are exact numbers. Also, all numbers that can uh, obtain the by definitions, uh, by definitions, uh, as uh, if you convert from one inch to uh, uh, centimeter, from one inch to centimeter, these two numbers, which is two something, two point something, okay, all these numbers are exact because uh, they are defined by a rule. They are defined by a rule. So these numbers are exact. And the, 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 the rule here for the exact number, that exact number contains exact number, an exact number contains infinite number of significance figures. Infinite number of significance figures. Okay? So they have an infinite number of significance figures. Examples, 10 experiments, 3 apples, 8 molecules, all these numbers are, if I asked you, how many significant figures in this number? One or zero or infinite? Infinite, because it is an exact number. Exact number. It has infinite number of uh, significance. If I asked you, uh, two, this two here, in two by R, in the uh, circumference of a circle or even the volume of a sphere, Huh? If I asked you how many significance figures in this number, you should say infinite, infinite number. And also in the one inch, the conversion to the centimeter, all of them, they are exact number. They contain infinite number of significance figures. Exercise, count this significance figure. Student extraction when a T yields this number of caffeine. How many significance figures in this number? Three. Mm, three. Right, right. Okay, three significant. So, how about these zeros? This one and this one. Leading zero. You should you should know the the, the nomenclature. Okay, the the uh, you, you should justify the, the the different types of zero. How about this zero? So what does it call? How can you call it? This one is. Uh, Cabotive zero, okay? So uh, in the question, sometimes I ask you, in this number, how many cabotive zeros are there? Okay? Is one, okay? So you should, you should be familiar with the naming also of the zeros, okay? Okay, the other question here, how many significance figures in this number? One, two, three, four, five. So how about this zero? Is train zero? Uh, is it counted? Yeah. Why? Because we have a decimal point. We have a decimal point, so this uh, trailing zero is is counted as a significant significance. So we have here five significant figures. Okay. How about this number? How many significance figures we have? Ignore this, actually. You sh should not pay any attention for the exponent here. How many figure significant? Four significant. We have four, right? We have four significance no, figures. Figure. Yes. Which one? Yeah. Here? Here? No. no. Th this one? Ah, okay. This, uh, 
Because this is just a conversion between units. If you say millimeter or uh, kilometer, we, we don't care about milli, kilo. We are looking for the measurement itself. Okay? Okay? Even if you, if, if you want to convert this value to uh, the decimal notation, you remember the decimal notation that we uh, described last lecture? If you want to convert this to the decimal uh, notation, it will be 0 0.000. All these zeros are leading zeros. When you count, leading zeros are not counted, right? Okay. Here, uh, now we are familiar with counting how many significant figures we have in the measurements. How about if you made some calculations with these figures? One number may contain uh, three significant figures and another number may have four significant figures. How about the result? Should it contain three or four? We will see now in the calculations. If the calculations are divided to two different categories. The first one is multiplication and division. And in this rule, count, it says that count number of significant in each number, in each number, being multiplied or divided, and they limit the answer to the least of them, and limit the answer to the least of them. I will give you an example. This now, how many significant figures we have? Three. In 1.4, how many significance? Two. The result should contain only two significance figures. This is the rule. Okay? So, if you use the calculator, you will get this number. If you left it this way, then the answer is incorrect. Okay? You have to limit this to the least significance figures of the least, of, of, uh, of the, the, the entering numbers, okay? So this number should be corrected, uh, rounded, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about the rules of rounding uh, maybe in the next slide, okay? So this is 6.38 should be written this way. Sometimes when you ask you in the exam, you feel that, are you asking us in uh, multiplication division, we are in the... Uh, I was still in the uh, high school or in the, or in the uh, but, but the, the question is that we are asking you to know if you are feeling the significance of precision and accuracy or not. Okay? If you measure this number with a tool that can give you three significant figures, it means that this six of this figure is certain or uncertain? Is certain or uncertain? The last digit is certain or uncertain? Uncertain. Answer. I said that the number of significant figures are all the certain digits plus the last uncertain plus the plus the last uncertain digit. So this six is uncertain. So the precision of this measurements is that. It can only observe the, the first decimal point accurately, but the, the second decimal point is not accurate. Here, how about this measurement? Which one is certain and which one is uncertain? 1.4, which one is certain and the, which one is uncertain? One is certain, but four is uncertain. So the first place here, the first decimal place in 1.4 is uncertain, is uncertain. If you made any calculations between two, between these two numbers, the results may not be or should not be more precise than the least of them. I cannot give uh, more uh, precision than the least of them. How about this result? It means that four, number four in 6.4, four is accurate or is, 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 uh, is, uh, certain or uncertain? Is uncertain, right? If I added anything here, like 6, 0, 
Boil 3, 8, it means that 3, number 3 here is certain. It's certain. Okay? But actually, the multiplication cannot give any certainty for the first <coughs> decimal place. Okay? This is the significance of the rule. We are not asking you to play with the calculator. We are asking you here to understand the precision. Okay? The results, if you are using, uh, if you are measuring with two different machines, and one has lower precision, the results should not be more precise than, than the least of them. It should be at, it should be precise as the least of them. Precise as the least of them. Okay? Okay. The other rule here is addition and subtraction. In the first uh, case, in the multiplication division, I, I said that the result should not, uh, should have the same precision as the least of them, right? Same significance figure as the least of them. But here in the addition and subtraction, is not dealing with the significance figures at all. Okay, so it says no number of significance is not considered here in the addition and subtraction. But they considered the number of decimal points or decimal places, the number of decimal places. It says that the result should have the same number of decimal places as the least precise measurement in the calculation. Okay, so if you want to uh, add these numbers together, look at the first one here, how many decimal places it has, two. The, the second one, one. The third one, three. So the result should contain only one decimal point. Only one decimal. Regardless of the number of significance figures, I will not pay any attention here for the significance figures. Okay? Only I will look to the decimal places. Okay? So this is the result. And the result should contain only one decimal place, so I have to correct or round to the nearest uh, decimal place. Okay? So now you are familiar with the rules for multiplication and division and the rule of addition and subtraction. Rounding, as I said, if you carry, uh, if you, uh, if you want to carry uh, extra digits through, the, uh, uh, first, in the rule of rounding, it says that carry extra digits through the measurements to the final result. To the final. So, because sometimes you, 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 you have mixed operation, mixed calculations, uh, division uh, plus uh, addition or whatever. So, uh, it always advise you to carry the decimal points to the end of the, or, uh, at the end of the calculation, and then round at the end. Uh, if the digit to be removed is less than five, uh, preceding digits uh, stay as the same, like this one, 1.33 will be 1.3. If uh, is higher or uh, equal to five, uh, preceding digit is increased by one. And this is one of the rules for uh, this uh, rounding. Uh, some other people uh, differentiate uh, if uh, the last digit is uh, is equal to 5 exactly. They give more uh, details for this step. But here in our uh, course here, we, we only focus, or we consider uh, this simple case of uh, rounding. Okay? So 1.36 will be rounded to 1.4. Also, it, uh, it says use only the first number to the right of the last significance figure. Only the, uh, the first number do not round sequentially. So rounding 6.834 to three significance figure. How can you make it? To only three significance figure will be 6.83, right? 
How about this? 6.8347 to uh, three significance to three significance figure. Uh, the, the, the description of this rule do not round sequentially. I want to round to three significance figure to here, right? So I lock to four. Ignore this seven. Do not say that seven will be rounded to five and the five to four. This is sequentially, okay? Do not round sequentially, okay? So only lock to the last digit you want to uh, to uh, round uh, at it. So the rounding here will be 6.883, okay? Uh, operation, mixed operation, 1.05. How many significance here? Three uh, divided by this number. How many significance figure? Four. Okay, so this is a result. So it should end to a three significance figure like like this. Okay, how about this? Twenty one minus thirteen point eight. How many decimal places here? Zero. How many decimal places here? One. The result should have no decimal places, right? So in the uh, in the exam. Uh, it will be uh, tricky a bit, okay? Uh, if I give you the results here, 7.2, uh, 7.2, and if you check 7.2, then the answer is wrong, okay? <coughs> Determine the value of the gas constant with the pressure, this pressure. How many significance we have here? Four. Uh, molar volume is uh, 8.8 .8 liter per uh, mole, and this is the temperature. So uh, is a mixed multiplication and uh, division. Carry all the uh, significance figures or the decimal points to the end of the calculation, and then you correct to the uh, to the correct. Uh, Significance figure according to the rule. This is multiplication and uh, division. So uh, the last number will be corrected to the least significance figure. To the least significant figure. Here we have two significance figures. This is the least significance figure. So th the result should have only two significance figures. Uh, this is two and this is also how many significance figures here? Two. Also two because the, the these zeros are trailing, okay? Ah, you should uh, train yourself at home about this, okay? Dimensionalist analysis, this is if you convert from uh, a unit to another unit, uh, but uh, remember this rule, uh, apples and orange uh, do not uh, add. Uh, you, may, you cannot uh, convert uh, length to time, for example. Length and time do not a do not add together. Okay, so you can convert, of course, but you should keep the dimension. You should keep the dimension. Okay, here calculate the in inch the length of two point eight five centimeter bin, knowing that this rule. How about this rule? All these figures. How many significance figures here? Three. How many significance figures here? One. Right. The, uh, anyone has uh, another answer? Three and one? These are exact numbers, right? Exact. How many significance figures is the exact number? How many? Infinite number. I said any number that you can obtained by counting or definition is an exact number, right? How many significance figure in exact numbers? Infinite number, okay? If you said here, if, if I gave you this in an exam and you said three, of course is, is wrong, okay? Huh? So in the exact number, there are infinite number of say, and here you will feel the significance of the dimensionless analysis. Dimensionless analysis, okay? 
So here, one, one inch equal to 2.54 centimeter, okay? So to make the conversion here, we will use this unit factor. This is called unit factor, unit factor, because uh, both bars are equal to each other, okay? So you convert 2.85 centimeter to inch, okay? How many significant figures in 2.85? See how many significant figures here in the in the uh, unit factor? How many in the unit factor? How many significant figures in finite number? Which is less? Which is less? This or this? No, infinite means infinity. Okay, okay. Uh, 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 so, uh, this is contain three significant figures. Okay? So this is the list. And this is the reason why we ignore the exact numbers in the calculations. We ignore the exact number in calculate because they have infinite number of significant figures. So you calculate the results and the results should contain also three significant figures like this. Okay? Okay? So this is the, the essence of the dimension, dimensionless analysis, okay? Dimensional analysis, dimensional analysis, okay? So exercise, how many milliliters are in 1.63 liter, okay? You convert also using this unit factor. How many significant figures in this unit factor? Infinite. So the, the result should contain also three significant figures like this, okay? The speed of sound in air is about three, four, three meter per second. What is this speed in miles per hour? So you have to use this conversion factors from second to hour and from mile to meter. Okay. So you, uh, cancel the uh, similar units together and you get the last uh, number here with the same significance figures as the uh, enter uh, number. So this ha will have three significance. This also will have three significant figures. The concept of limiting reactant, okay? So we'll switch to chemistry. But before we switch to chemistry, we'll go to a sandwich shop, okay? Because I know you are all hungry, okay? So, Suppose you have a part-time job in a popular sandwich shop, like uh, Pizza Hut, like uh, McDonald's, and you went to them in the first day, they took you to the kitchen and they uh, taught you how to prepare their popular and regular sandwich. The training, the first time. They said to you that our sandwich is composed of two slices bread. Okay, pay attention, please. Okay, two slices bread, three slices meat, one slice cheese. Those together are the popular sandwich. Okay. So, if you miss anything from the ingredients, you cannot make a sandwich. So if you have, for example, two slices bread, two slices meat, one slice cheese, can you make a sandwich? Yeah. No, according to this definition. Right? Okay. The popular sandwich should contain these ingredients. If you miss anything from the ingredients, you cannot make a sandwich. Right? Okay. Two slices bread, three slices meat, one slice cheese. If I give you two slices bread, two slices meat, so one slice is missing here. You cannot play around and say, okay, they will not observe. They should observe. Okay? You cannot violate. You don't have the, the option to violate. Okay? So if you miss any 
thing from the ingredients, this means that you cannot make a sandwich. Okay? The, uh, are we all agreeing about this? Okay? This is the start. This is very similar to the chemical equation. If you miss anything from the reactants, you cannot make the product. Right? Yep. If you miss anything from the reactant, you cannot make Perfect. the product. Right? We cannot play around like Egyptian people here and say, okay, but something from here and something from here and everything will be, this is not acceptable actually. Okay? So, test your performance. How many sandwiches you can make? You already are familiar with the stoichiometry of the sandwich. Great. This is the stoichiometry. Stoichiometry like the stoichiometry of equations. One mole plus two moles should be one mole plus two moles. Nothing else. Okay? So you are familiar now with the stoichiometry of the sandwich. Come here and test your performance. They gave you these things. Eight slices bread, nine slices meat, five slices cheese. How many sandwiches you can make? But remember the stoichiometry. How many sandwiches? Four, three. Anything else? Four or five? How can you calculate it? This is the idea because the same, I will apply the same, the same procedure to the calculations, to the chemical equations. Okay? Right? So, uh, uh, if you said three, how did you calculate three? How, how did you know? How did you know that they are three? How did you know that they are four? Guessing? No, no, we cannot guess here. We cannot guess. Okay, okay. I will, I will move with you step by step. Okay, okay. So the first thing, how many the, the bread they gave me? They gave me how many sandwiches the bread can make? Four, right? According to this, you divided it by two. It can make four. Well, these ingredients make also four sandwich how about the, the the meat it can make three how how about the slices it can make it can make five sandwich okay but they are together they cannot make they cannot make five they cannot make four they are together should make only three sandwich right so this, this is the approach. This is the approach. So to follow with some rules, the first rule is saying how many sandwiches that each ingredient can make. As I, as I said now, okay, this is the stoichiometry. You should uh, keep it in mind, okay? Next, this is the available that gave you eight, nine, five. Okay, we don't know so far how many sandwiches we can make. Okay, for the sandwich, bread can make four, meat can make three, cheese can make five. So the limiting reactant appears here. The limiting. What what what, what does it mean? Limiting, limiting, limiting. This is the reactant or the ingredient that will limit the amount of the product. Right? This is the limiting. Limiting reactant or limiting ingredient. This is the reactant or the ingredient that will limit the amount of, of the product. Okay? So here, limiting reactant is the reactant giving the lowest ratio of moles available to the stoichiometry or the coefficient in the balanced equation. In the balanced equation. Okay? So limiting reactant is the reactant giving the lowest ratio of the available amount to the stoichiometry. Available to the stoichiometry. This is the limiting and the product will follow the limiting reactant. Okay? So, if one meat give one sandwich, then 
three meat will give three sandwich right this is a balancing balancing okay so this is the first step and the first approach how many sandwiches that each ingredient can make the second you may look differently we will search here about the deficiency well, which one is deficient from the reactant how can you make the deficiency here this is a stoichiometry again and this is the available the bread can make four sandwich will meat be able to provide four sandwich with this amount no the, so this is uh, deficient meat is deficient cheese can make four sandwich yes is not deficient so the deficiency is only here in the meat then meat is the limiting reactant meat is so the second approach here is to find the reactant ha having a deficiency okay the third one here so limiting reactant is the reactant having a deficiency relatively to other reactants in view of the stoichiometry okay the third approach is to compare the moles ratio of required and available modes of required and available modes this is the equation again and this is the coefficients you uh, you need to compare the number of moles required to the number of moles available okay so available here we we have eight okay uh, and and meat we have nine and the cheese we have we have five okay so the coefficient for the so we, we will uh, take a, a reference as the bread coefficient, for example, okay, as a reference, okay. Uh, you, of course, you can take the meat or cheese, whatever. Which one you find it appropriate, you can, you can take it as a reference here. For the stoichiometry, if you, can, if you divide the coefficient 2 by the bread coefficient, which is 2 as well, okay, for bread will be 1, for meat will be 1.5 for cheese will be 0 0.5 okay this is for the stoichiometry or this is the uh, required the available you repeat the same thing with taking the reference uh, the bread as a reference okay so the available here is one the available here is 1.125 which is less than the required which is less than the required okay uh, so for, for the bread, the ratio here, one is exactly the same one for the cheese. This is higher even than the uh, required, but for meat is less than the required. So the meat again is the limiting reactant. So the limiting reactant can also be defined as the reactant that cannot provide the quantity required to consume the whole materials of other all these are definitions for the limiting reactant and this can apply to the chemical equations okay so the bread can make four sandwich meat can make three sandwich cheese five so overall we will have three sandwich when you run out of meat you must stop making sandwiches the meat is the limiting ingredient what do you have left over after making the sandwich we will have bread, we will have cheese, right? So you should calculate also what will be left over, okay? From the ingredient. This is the same principles of, these are the same principles of chemistry, okay? And the equation uh, balancing. This is a, a nice picture here for what you, uh, you made. And uh, as I, I said, we will have left over here bread and cheese and only we can make three sandwich here okay okay let us apply this to chemistry <laughs> okay or uh, do you want to uh, stay uh, a little more in uh, the sandwich <laughs> okay so <laughs> actually uh, this previous example i took this example from uh, the book of uh, zumdel Zumda, you remember the first reference I gave you in the last lecture? The first reference is very interesting book. I encourage all of you to have uh, a copy of this book. Even I think it's available uh, online. So I think it's very simple, very straightforward, very exciting. You will feel the chemistry very nicely with this book. Okay. 
So nitrogen gas can prepare the by passing against this ammonia. Uh, I want to also to uh, to tell you that in the, the uh, problems that we uh, gave you, uh, sometimes I describe for you some uh, technical uh, steps in the uh, in the process. Okay, so you should not uh, get uh, frustrated from reading the. The, 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 these details because the question will be very simple inside even if you don't understand anything from uh, the, 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 the head of the question you should look to the uh, given values and uh, you look to the uh, required calculations that uh, he will ask you okay nitrogen gas can be prepared by passing gases ammonia so the first chemical is ammonia the second in the product is nitrogen gas now you 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 are building equation you are building equation okay over solid copper two oxide so this is the second reactor at high temperature the other products of the reaction are solid copper and the water vapor okay so you can write the equation so this is the equation ammonia copper two oxide will give nitrogen, copper, solid copper, and water vapor, right? The first thing, when you write an equation, you should make Balance. balancing. Is it balanced? No, not balanced. So you have to balance the equation. And this is the given amounts that gave you 18.1 gram ammonia, 90.4 gram copper. This is in the question here. Well, it gave you this amount of ammonia, this amount of copper oxide, and is asking you now which is limiting reactant, which is limit. What, what, what does it mean by limiting here? It's meaning we need to assign the amount of the product. Before you assign the amount of the, or you calculate the amount of the product, you have to first look or find the limiting reactant. It's very simple exactly as the sandwich okay okay so uh, the first thing uh, it requires here is which is the limiting reactant the second one calculate the mass of nitrogen mass of nitrogen uh, you remember in the last lecture uh, i prefer to convert everything every mass to mole to a number of mole okay so we'll proceed similarly okay so this equation is not balanced. We need to balance. How can you balance this? This is one nitrogen. The, here is two nitrogen. So we, we have to put here two. Okay. Uh, how many hydrogen now? Six. And this is two. We put here three. How many oxygen? Three. You put here three. Okay. How many copper? Three. You put here three. Everything is fine. Okay. So this is the equation. Okay. After you get the equation, the first thing, convert to moles. The masses it gives you. How can I convert? You will need the molar mass. And if you have the molar mass, you just divide the mass by the molar mass. You convert this to number of moles. And the same applies to copper oxide. Okay, this is the stoichiometry. Two moles of ammonia requires three moles of copper oxide. But actually, you have one mole of ammonia or 1.06 mole of ammonia, 1.14 mole of copper oxide. By vision, what do you think? Which is limiting? Which is limiting? Ammonia or copper oxide? Ammonia? Uh, because he, he looked to this number and he said ammonia. But actually, we do not look to this number as this, you remember in the sandwich, how many pieces of meat I gave you in the example? How many pieces of meat? Nine. But it was the limiting. It was the highest amount, but it was limiting. The, the material that will be finished first, the highest. Why? Because the stoichiometry of meat was high. Every sandwich will take Three pieces of meat, three pieces of 
of me. So you should not look to the stoichiometry of the equation and judge. You should not look to this. Huh? This is two and this is three. You should not say that ammonia will be will be limiting. This is a wrong way. Okay? But how can you how can you assign assign? You should look to this stoichiometry in view of the given amounts here. Okay? Every two moles requires three moles. So, uh, then, this one point oh six mole of ammonia. How many moles of copper oxide is requiring according to the stoichiometry? 1.5. 1.5 times this number, right? Because two to two moles require three. Then one mole require 1.5. Right? Right? If this is, uh, for simplicity is one, then at least of copper oxide we need 1.5. Do we have 1.5? We do not have. We have less. We have less than the required value. Then copper oxide is limiting. Is limiting. Okay? Let us apply the rule that we have taken. Okay? Moles of copper oxide required to react with 1.6. The number of moles of copper oxide required is 1.59 according to the stoichiometry. This is the number of moles of ammonia and this is the stoichiometry 3 over 2. Okay? So it requires 1.59. Do we have 1.59? We do not have. We have only 1.14. Then copper oxide is limited. Let us verify this answer. Answer. Uh, let us calculate the required value. Okay, so the number of moles of copper oxide to the number of moles of ammonia is 1.5. For the given, or the actual value, is it, is it uh, the same or less or more? It is less. Okay, then the number of moles of copper oxide have a deficiency. Have a deficiency. Then copper oxide is limiting. Let us double verify. Make a double verification. Okay. The limiting reactant should have the lowest ratio of moles available to the coefficient. For ammonia, moles available to the stoichiometry is 0.535. For copper oxide is 0.38. Then copper oxide has a deficiency. All this, we are running all these calculations just to assign the limiting reactant. Because the mass or the amount of the product will depend directly to the limiting reactor to the limiting reactor okay so now we agree together that copper oxide is the limiting reactor okay the the other thing that uh, it needs to calculate here is to find the mass of uh, nitrogen uh, we must use the amount of limiting reactant copper oxide to calculate the amount of nitrogen first calculate the number of moles of nitrogen we have 1.14 mole of copper oxide. And according to the balance of the equation, the stoichiometry of nitrogen to the copper oxide, for every three mole of copper oxide, only one mole of nitrogen is produced. Okay? So you, you apply this to calculate the number of moles of nitrogen. So this is the number of moles of nitrogen. And if you want to convert it to mass, you multiply it by the molar mass of nitrogen. So overall, we will have 10.6 gram of, of nitrogen. The percent yield, uh, we calculated in the last example here, the mass of nitrogen. This is the theoretical mass of nitrogen, theoretical, that you can uh, obtain with calculations. Okay, this is theoretical. But exactly, if you apply this uh, example in the lab, and you mix it, these values together of uh, ammonia with copper oxide, do you think you will obtain this value, 10.6, exactly or less or more? Which one you will obtain? Exactly 10.6 or less or more? Can you obtain more than 10.6? Can you obtain more than 10.6? You cannot obtain more than the theoretical yield. You cannot obtain more than theoretically. But can you obtain 10.6 exactly? 
if this is the case, then the efficiency of the production is 100%. It's 100%. But in reality, you, it is very difficult to obtain the 100% efficiency. It should be less than this. Maybe side reactions or for any other reason. Huh? Usually, you, may, uh, you can obtain less than the theoretical yield, which is called the actual yield. The actual yield. The, the, the actual yield with the theoretical yield, you can calculate the percent yield, the percent yield, okay? So, so the theoretical yield is the amount of a product that is expected by calculations to be obtained assuming the limiting area is completely consumed, okay? Uh, side reactions may reduce this value. Actual yield is the amount of it that is obtained actually, okay? The percent yield is the actual yield over the theoretical yield times uh, 100, okay? So you can calculate this, and uh, many questions in the exam uh, may appear with this, with this rule, okay? Exercise. Methanol is the simplest alcohol, is used as a fuel in race cars, and is a potential replacement for gasoline. Okay, maybe you can ignore all this if you are not uh, interesting, okay? Uh, methanol can be manufactured by combining this is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So this is the reactant, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Suppose uh, 68.5 kilogram carbon monoxide is reacted with uh, 8.6 kilogram of hydrogen. Calculate the theoretical yield of methanol. And if this is the actual yield, how can you calculate the percent yield? Okay, write the equation. This is a balanced equation, okay? Two moles of hydrogen plus CO uh, give uh, the methanol, okay? You convert to mass two moles as we did in the last uh, example. So uh, six, 68.5 kilogram of carbon monoxide is uh, almost 2.44 uh, uh, kilomole of carbon monoxide, okay? And also do the same for hydrogen. And now we are in a way to assign the limiting reaction, which is limiting carbon monoxide or hydrogen. First for hydrogen, if you uh, divide the moles available to the stoichiometry, you will get this number for hydrogen. We have, uh, I, I want you to notice that the number of moles of hydrogen available is 4.27 kilomole, okay? But if you divide by the stoichiometry, you will get this number, 2.1, 2.1, okay? Uh, times 10 to the power C. If you, if you repeat the same for carbon monoxide, you will get 2.44, which will have the deficiency hydrogen, 2.1. Hydrogen will have a deficiency. Then hydrogen is the limiting reactant. Then the uh, mass or the number of moles of methanol will depend on the limiting reactor, which is hydrogen. How many moles of hydrogen we have? This is the stoichiometry of hydrogen to the methanol in the balanced equation, two, uh, two, one, two to one. So uh, initially, uh, hydrogen was 4.2 something. Okay, now the number of moles of uh, methanol is 2.135 times uh, or kilomole, uh, kilomole of methanol. If you multiply with the molar mass of methanol, then you, you get the mass, the mass of uh, methanol produced, okay? Uh, this is actually the uh, theoretical yield, okay? Theoretical yield. But uh, he gave you in the, uh, in the question that the actual yield is 3.57. So you can tie, uh, you can divide the actual yield by the theoretical yield uh, to get the uh, the percentage, which is here uh, 52. Okay. Of course, you can uh, move in this question in the opposite direction. I can give you the percent, uh, and I can give you uh, some information to calculate the theoretical yield. And I may ask you about the actual yield. Anything. Everything will be given and something will be missing. So you have to apply 
the uh, rules to calculate the missing value. Another exercise in this ex equation, look at this equation. Uh, sometimes we ask you about uh, uh, equations uh, that are written with, uh, with symbols, like this one, okay? 2a plus b give a to b, okay? Uh, if you mix one mole of a, one mole of a with two mole of b, the number of moles of A to B, that is, of course, this equation is balanced. This equation is balanced. And he makes it one mole of A with two mole of B. How many moles of A to B will be produced? How many moles? According to the stoichiometry of the equation, every two moles of A require how many moles of B? One mole. One mole. Okay? So, if you have only one mole of A, okay, so this one of mole will require half of the value, half, half of B, half mole of B. Do we have half mole of B? We have more, we have more, okay? So uh, one mole will take only half to produce also half, also half mole of A to B, because the psychometry is reading this way. 2 to 1 to 1, 2 to 1 to 1, okay? This is the stoichiometry, and everything should move according to the stoichiometry, okay? Again, according to the stoichiometry, if you have two mole of A and one mole of B, this way they will react together to produce one mole of A to B. But if you have only one mole of A, this will require the existence of 0 0.5 mole of B, to produce 0 0.5 mole of <coughs> in other way the balanced equations can be multiplied by any factor by any factor to multiply by 0 0.5 or to multiply by 4 but you should multiply all the stoichiometric numbers in the same way okay okay here in the question is saying one mole of A is mixed with two mole of B. How many moles of A to B can be produced? 0 0.5. 0. Which is limiting here? A. A is limiting because oh, A is consumed completely. A is consumed completely. What will be left over from the reactants? Left over from the reactants. How many? How, how much? How much? No, 1.5. 1.5. Only 0 0.5 will be consumed. Okay? Let me explain this quickly on the board. This is the equation, okay? 2A plus B gave A to B. The psychometry says that if you have two mole of A and if you have one mole of B, they will react together to give one mole of A to B, right? Is there anything here will be left over? In this, in this case? No, nothing will remain. Nothing will remain. All of them will be consumed. Okay? Okay? But if you have now, okay, let me say, if you have one mole of A, 0 0.5 mole of B, so I, 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 I multiply this equation by 0 0.5, okay? By 0 0.5, okay? So one mole of A will react with 0 0.5 mole of B to give 0 0.5 mole of B. Is there anything will be left over here from the reactants? No, also no. But look at this case. If I mix it one mole of A with... 2 mole of B. 2 mole can be divided to 0 0.5 and 1.5 plus 1.5, right? According to this equation, 1 react with 0 0.5 to give 0 0.5. So the product will be 0 0.5 and 1.5 gram of V will be left over, right? Which is the limiting reactor in this case? 1, A. A, because A is consumed completely 
and the product appeared in the same in the same ratio as the limiting reactor. Here, two give one, and here one give half, right? So the, the amount of the product will be uh, result will be will, will be uh, appear exactly as the stoichiometry with the limiting reactor. Okay. Okay. Another question. Look at this equation. 2A plus B give AC. I did not say that this equation is balanced. I did not say that it is not balanced. Okay. This is a equation. It might be, it may be balanced. It may not be balanced. Okay. And now is asking here, which of the following statement will be correct? Look, C equal to A plus B. Is it possible that C equal to A plus B? C equal to A plus B, yes, if the equation is balanced, right? If the equation is balanced, then C will equal to A plus B. So this is <coughs> correct. Is it possible that B equal to 2C? B equal to 2C? It, uh, why, why you are saying no? It may be yes. If the equation is not balanced, right? Like this, okay? What, what, do, what, what, does, uh, what, what do I mean by uh, unbalanced? If B equal to 2C, then 2A plus 2C will give 2AC, right? But missing the 2 here means that the equation is not balanced, okay? So this will be correct if the equation is not balance it okay the third one is it possible for 2e plus b to equal to ac yes this is the equation that gave you okay so this if the equation is balancing this is true this is true so the answer here will be all of them all of them are true uh, i just want to think about balanced and unbalanced equations and to see the relation between the reactants and the products and uh, this uh, varies. Exercise: a limiting reactant in a chemical equation. Choose, choose which which is is is, uh, is correct here. Okay, has the lowest coefficient in a balanced equation? Is it has the lowest uh, equi uh, is the low, lowest coefficient? No, no, of course no. Has the lowest ratio of moles available to coefficient in the balanced equation? Yes, this is yes. Okay. Has the lowest ratio of coefficient in the balance the, the opposite of this. Okay. The opposite is incorrect. The opposite is you should you should read very carefully. You should read very you, starting from chem one zero two, you should count your figures when you are reading the uh, questions. Okay. Ideal gases. This is the next chapter. Uh, what time is now? <laughs> 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. 10 minutes. I will use the 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ideal gases. This is the next chapter. We'll start talking about the states of matter. Uh, and uh, principally here, the state of a gas can be fully described in terms of four variables. The mass, the volume, the pressure, temperature, and will derive the equation of state of this. Previous in the high school, you studied the uh, equations, Boyle's law, Charles' law, and Avogadro's law. So uh, Boyle's law gave a relationship between the vapor, uh, between the volume of a gas in a container and the pressure. As I said, the the state of the any gas is identified by four variables: the volume, the pressure, the temperature. And the amount, okay, amount which is a number of moles. If you know three of them, you can calculate the force. If you know three of them, you can calculate the force. So to get a relationship between two of them, the other two should be fixed. The other two should be fixed, okay. So if if Boyle's law states that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. But if I asked you about the statement of Boyle's law and you said that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure of the gas, 
and you stop at this statement, then I will say this is incorrect. This is wrong. Okay? Because you did not fix the other two variables, which are the temperature and the amount of the gas. Okay? So to give a, a, a proper, a proper uh, statement for Boyle's law, you should say the, the volume of a given amount of a gas. Look at a given amount. So I fix it, the amount. The volume of a given, of a given amount of a gas is inversely proportional to the gas pressure at constant temperature. At constant temperature. So to give a relationship between two of them, you should fix the other two. This should appear in the statement and should appear even in the mathematical formula. Okay, so the volume is inverse proportion to the pressure. You can plot it in this way, BV equal to constant, or B1, V1 equal to B2, V2. And this is the statement at a constant temperature, the volume of a fixed amount of a gas is inverse proportion to the, to the pressure. Uh, graphically, and this is very interesting for you, you should uh, be familiar with how to convert the formula, mathematical formula, to a graph and the opposite also. Okay, because uh, many times we ask about the graphs. Okay, so this is the pressure and the volume, and the relationship is uh, inversely proportional the pressure with the with the volume of the gas, and you can put it this way: volume uh, against one over b to get a straight line uh, with the slope here. Uh, uh, the constant K in the first equation here, okay? Okay, so if you repeat the same figure at uh, at three different temperature, what do you think? Which one will be the highest temperature and which one will be the lowest temperature? At three different temperatures, the blocks will appear this way, okay? So this R here, the red R is going from from lower temperature to higher or the opposite. From lower to to higher, okay. So because actually, if you increase the temperature at the same volume, the pressure will will increase, okay. So Boyle's law holds precisely only at very low pressure, at very low pressure. It deviates from the ideal behavior at high <coughs> at high pressure, okay. And this is obvious in this graph. This is the BV. Again, it's to be supposed for BV. I said according to Boyle's law, BV equal to BV equal to equal to what? BV equal to I said B is, is inverse proportional with the pressure. So BV equal to constant. BV equal to constant. Okay. So normally, if we are in the ideal behavior, the BV should have a horizontal straight line like the dotted blue line here, okay? But actually at high pressures, if you look to other gases here like carbon dioxide and oxygen, they deviate from the ideal behavior, particularly at high pressure. But if you go to lower pressure, all of them, they go to the ideal behavior. They go to the ideal behavior and we'll investigate it. Inshallah, I will describe in the next lecture about the real behavior and the deviation from the ideal behavior. Exercise, if uh, sulfur dioxide, a gas, uh, 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 okay, uh, let us go direct to the problem. Consider 1.53 liter uh, of uh, sulfur dioxide at a pressure, it gives a volume and the pressure and is asking now if the pressure change it to this one, the pressure is uh, increased, okay? So this is the first pressure and the first volume and the pressure increased now is asking here about the, uh, the uh, yes, the uh, V2. So we apply the rule here, B1 equal to V1, uh, equal to B2, V2, and you can calculate very simply the volume, and the volume will appear here, 0 0.57 liter. This is actually less than uh, this volume, and this is a verification of 
the rule the volume decrease when the pressure increase this is the verification for Boyle's law okay uh, Charles law is a relationship between volume and temperature uh, V also uh, the volume of a fixed amount of a gas at a constant pressure increased linearly with the gas temperature okay uh, and very interesting feature here that all gases extrapolate to this point here at the zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin or the uh, absolute temperature, absolute zero. This is the absolute zero, absolute zero. All the gases extrapolate to a zero volume, to a zero. This is very important. This is very important. All gases extrapolate here to the zero, to the zero uh, volume at the absolute zero temperature okay uh, and you can of course uh, convert from Slesius to kelvin here also the same feature appear appear here different slopes because they have different number of modes the volume of gas extrapolate to zero at the absolute absolute as another example also for uh, this charles uh, uh, for uh, charles law uh, sample of uh, gas at uh, 15 degrees Celsius. One atmosphere has a volume of uh, 2.58 liter. Of course, you should uh, convert the Celsius to Kelvin in uh, all of them. And now it's asking what volume will this gas occupy at 38 degrees Celsius? Okay. Very simple as the example I gave uh, V1 and this is T1. V2 is asking about V2. So you apply the rule here. V1 over T1 equal to V2 over T2, and you can calculate V2 here. Uh, and this is the new volume. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, to Muhammad Wasal? Okay. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Avogadro's law. Uh, the volume of a given amount of a gas is proportional to uh, the volume of uh, a gas is proportional to the number of moles at constant temperature and constant pressure. And one of the statements of this law is uh, of this law equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and the pressure contains the same number of particles. Or for a gas at a constant T and B, the volume is directly proportional to the number of moles. Regardless of the identity of the gas, this applies, this rule applies. Any, 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 uh, if the gas has the same number of uh, moles, they will occupy, occupy the same, uh, the same volume, uh, regardless the, uh, the, uh, the identity of the gas. Okay? And this is a similar exercise for Avogadro's law. Uh, we have uh, a cylinder of 12.2 uh, .2 liter sample containing 0 0.5 mole of oxygen gas at a pressure of one atmosphere and temperature of 25 degrees. If all this oxygen were converted to uh, 0 0.33 mole of ozone at the same temperature and the pressure, what be the volume of uh, ozone? This is V1, N1, and we need to calculate uh, V2. Uh, you apply the Avogadro's uh, formula and you can calculate V2. Another example, ammonia burns in oxygen to form nitric oxide and this is the equation. It's asking how many volumes of NO are obtained from one volume of ammonia. According to the stoichiometry, one mole of ammonia uh, will uh, give one mole of NO. So if you have uh, at constant pressure and temperature, one volume of ammonia, this will give one volume of uh, nitric oxide. Uh, thank you for your attention today. And I will stop here and continue uh, next lecture, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.